Hello, today we will focus on two-dimensional curves. In the plane, we can distinguish between clockwise rotation and counterclockwise rotation. For us, clockwise rotation will be interpreted as negative and counterclockwise rotation will be interpreted as positive. We begin this lesson by defining the angle function. For a plane smooth curve gamma parametrized by arc length, its tangent indicatrix is a function from AB to the unit circle, so we can find the continuous function theta from AB to the real numbers that corresponds to the argument of the tangent indicatrix. For example, if gamma is a line, its tangent indicatrix is constant and theta can be chosen to be constant as well. When the curve is not a straight line anymore, then theta keeps track of the change in d. Of course, theta is not unique, as we can add a multiple of 2 pi without changing the value of trigonometric functions. Also, notice that if a curve starts and ends with the same direction, the value of theta is not necessarily the same at the beginning and at the end, as it may have shifted by a multiple of 2 pi. With this angle function, we can define the sine curvature as the derivative of theta. Notice that even though theta was not unique, the sine curvature is. The relationship between the sine curvature and the absolute curvature is straightforward. Recall that for a parametrization by arc length, the absolute curvature is the length of t prime, which after expressing t in terms of theta, becomes simply the absolute value of the sine curvature. For parametrizations that are not by arc length, I leave it as an exercise to check that the sine curvature can be computed directly with this formula, which reduces to an even simpler one when the curve is parametrized by arc length. So in practice, even though we need the angle function theta to define the sine curvature, we don't need theta to compute k. This should make sense as the concept of sine curvature is quite natural. If we are driving a car, the curvature of our trajectory coincides with the position of the steering wheel positive if we are turning left, and negative if we are turning right. Just like for the absolute curvature, we can define the total sine curvature of a curve as the integral of the sine curvature. We can also define the total sine curvature of a piecewise smooth regular curve as the total sine curvature of the smooth pieces plus the changes of direction at each breakpoint, counted with positive sine if the particle turns left and with negative sine if the particle turns right. Unfortunately, this is not well defined for a 180 degree turn because it can be interpreted both as a right turn and as a left turn. And lastly, for closed piecewise smooth regular curves, in the definition of total sign curvature, we also consider the difference between the initial direction and the final direction, just like we did for total curvature. From the triangle inequality and the fact that the absolute curvature is the absolute value of the sign curvature, we can deduce that the total sine curvature in absolute value is always at most the total absolute curvature. This is very natural as psi measures the total displacement of theta, while phi measures the distance traveled by theta. By now you may have noticed that if a curve is closed, then its total sine curvature has to be a multiple of 2 pi. That is of course because the final direction equals the initial direction. In the particular case when the curve is smooth, this follows from the fact that the initial value of theta and the final value of theta have the same sine and cosine, so they differ by a multiple of 2 pi. If you are familiar with the concept of winding number, this integer m is precisely the winding number of the tangent indicatrix around the origin. For a smooth closed curve, this number can be an integer. For a circle, it is either 1 or minus 1, but for the infinite symbol, it is 0. A very important result about total sine curvature is the theorem of turning tangents. It says that for a simple closed piecewise smooth regular curve, its total sine curvature is either 2 pi or minus 2 pi. In terms of winding number, it says that the tangent indicatrix winds around once and only once. This quantity will be 2 pi when the region surrounded by gamma lies on the left of gamma, and minus 2 pi when the region surrounded by gamma lies on its right. To prove this theorem, we first need an elementary result about polygons in the plane. This lemma says that for a simple closed piecewise linear curve, the sum of its interior angles is n minus 2 times pi, where n is the number of sides. This lemma is proved by induction on the number of sides, the base of induction being the fact that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is pi. 
Then we take a polygon with n sides and assume the lemma holds true for polygons with strictly less sides. Our goal now is to cut the polygon along a segment between two of its vertices in order to obtain two smaller polygons to which we can apply the induction hypothesis. The first step will be to pick a point in the polygon with interior angle strictly less than pi. I leave it to you to show that it exists. Then there are two cases to consider. The easy one is when the line segment connecting the two adjacent vertices doesn't intersect the rest of the polygon. In that case, we can cut the polygon along that segment and apply the induction hypothesis to each piece. In the second case, the segment between the two vertices adjacent to the one we chose intersects the rest of the polygon, so there are some vertices inside this triangle. What we do next is quite simple. Just slide this segment towards the point we initially chose. It will intersect all vertices inside this triangle, and we stop at the last vertex touched by this process. By the steps we have followed, the line segment connecting this vertex that is now touching the moved segment to the vertex we initially chose does not intersect the rest of the polygon, and we can cut along this line to obtain two smaller polygons. I'll leave it to you to check that if we apply the induction hypothesis to each side, we get the result. This is just a one-line computation. Now back to our main theorem. Actually, we will just prove it for smooth curves, and I will also leave to you to think about how to adjust it for piecewise smooth regular curves. We begin by choosing a partition of the domain so that when we take the inscribed broken line corresponding to this partition, it is a simple closed polygon and the total curvature along each subinterval is less than pi. By the Jordan curve theorem, the curve gamma divides the plane into regions, its interior and its exterior. From now on, we will assume the region surrounded by gamma lies on its left. The other case is of course analogous. Now for each i, we let wi be the vector going from pi to pi plus 1. We let alpha i be the angle that goes from gamma prime at ti to wi. Similarly, beta i is the angle going from wi minus 1 to gamma prime at ti, and theta be the interior angle of the polygon at pi. Note that alpha and beta are sine the angles that can potentially be negative from minus pi to pi, while theta is always a non-negative number between 0 and 2 pi. One relationship between these angles is that for each i, alpha plus beta plus theta is always pi. I'll leave it to you to verify this, but be careful. By looking at the drawing it may be tempting to claim that this is obvious, but in the case the region surrounded by gamma lies on its right, the equation is false and the relationship between alpha, beta and theta is slightly different. Now summing over all i, we get n pi, but from the previous lemma we know that the sum of the interior angles is n minus 2 times pi, so this implies that the sum of the alphas and betas is precisely 2 pi. All we are left to show is that the sum of alphas and betas is precisely the total sine curvature of gamma. We now focus on a single piece, and observe that alpha i plus beta i plus 1 is the angle from gamma prime at ti to wi and then to gamma prime at ti plus 1. Since sine the angles are additive modulo 2 pi, this means that alpha i plus beta i plus 1 is the change of angle for gamma prime from ti to ti plus 1 plus a multiple of 2 pi the last term being precisely the total curvature along that interval. However, the total sine curvature along an interval is controlled in absolute value by the total curvature along that interval, and by the court lemma, the same is true for alpha i plus beta i plus 1. By our choice of partition, this total curvature is strictly less than pi, and hence alpha i plus beta i plus 1 equals psi along the interval. Now, summing over all i, we can conclude that the total sine curvature is precisely 2pi. This finishes the proof of the theorem and today's lesson. 